It was one year and one month ago, in the month of January 2021, when we first started out on our journey through Mark's gospel. Right now, we have reached about the halfway point, as we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, I don't expect you to recall everything, or maybe even anything from that first message, even if you weren't here, but perhaps you know something about the structure of Mark's gospel. We talked about it such a long time ago, but essentially, Mark's gospel is hung on the framework of four pegs, four confessions or testimonies about Jesus. The very first confession is in chapter 1, verse 1. It's the author's own confession. It's Mark's testimony concerning Jesus. The beginning of the gospel, he writes, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That opening line effectively functions as the title of Mark's gospel, introducing the subject matter as the person and work of Jesus, what he's going to do as the Messiah and who he is as the divine Son of God. We're going to come back to the second confession in a moment, but I want to say a word or two first about the second half of Mark's gospel, beginning with confession number three. This is Jesus' own testimony about himself. At the very heart, key verse of our um, look at Mark's gospel, it's Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is Jesus' own confession about himself. That's where we originate the title of our series, The Suffering Servant Savior for Sinners. Then the fourth confession, the final confession, comes in Mark 15, 39. The Roman centurion Gazing upon the cross, seeing Jesus breathe his last, he declares, truly this man was the Son of God. It's at that moment that God scraped away those scales from his eyes so that he could see Jesus clearly as the divine Son of God, just as Mark records at the very front of his gospel. Circling back now to that second confession comes from the Apostle Peter in our passage this morning in Mark 8. 27 to 30. If you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. We're going to read it in a moment. Peter's confession marks the very center of Mark's gospel. It's the great hinge that divides Mark's gospel into two halves. The first half, so far, has been focusing on Jesus as the servant of the Lord. Mark paints Jesus as having sovereign authority over diseases disabilities, demons, disasters, and even death. The second half of Mark's gospel, as we're going to get into beginning next week, starts in verse 31 of chapter 8, and it runs all the way to the end of the gospel, where Mark is going to present Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord, who ultimately came to serve sinners by saving them through his sacrifice on the cross. Mark 8, 27 to 30, it's the turning point of Mark's focus. The very first half of his gospel up until this point, Mark has been asking this underlying question to his readers and to us, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus according to his works, according to his words so far in Mark's gospel? Let's go ahead and read from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30, where Peter gives us a definitive answer to that question. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged his disciples to tell no one about him. From this moment on, this part in Mark's gospel on to the end, Mark is going to pose two further underlying questions. Peter has answered the first, who is Jesus? He is the Christ. The two further questions he's going to ask, which we're going to see next week and then the following week, respectively, is what does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? And then lastly, what does it mean to follow him as his disciple? What does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? And what does it mean to follow him as his disciple? 
We're going to see answers to those questions pop up regularly, not just next week and the week after, but repeatedly throughout the second half of Mark's gospel. But we need to definitively grapple with that first question once again. Who is Jesus? Or, as our theme is, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? That's a fundamental question to all of life, to your very existence. Your answer to this question is going to chart the course to the rest of your life. It's the foundation upon which the rest of your life is going to be built based on how you answer this question. Answer this question wrongly, and you cannot be right with God. You cannot answer this question wrongly and be right with God. But answer this question right, and you're well on your way to living a life that is pleasing to God and glorifying His Son. Your answer to this question from Jesus is literally the difference between heaven and hell. It is, as we've already read in 1 John chapter 5, the difference between being born of God the Father and being born of the devil, as Jesus will charge the Pharisees of. Who do you say Jesus is? Let's go into our text this morning. And as we journey through it, we're going to discover for ourselves what the correct and only response can be to Jesus' all-important, fundamental, life-changing question. And as we traverse through the text, we're going to encounter three road markers that are going to help us and direct us to the only correct answer that Peter gave. The first marker in these verses is a symbolic location. A symbolic location. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. The city of Caesarea Philippi, it's a city that was 25 miles north from the town of Bethsaida, where Jesus has just healed the blind man in our previous passage we looked at last week. It was only a day's journey from the northern shore of Galilee in the town of Bethsaida up to the city or region of Caesarea Philippi. And so you can imagine Jesus and his disciples approaching the villages uh, either as the sun is setting or perhaps is already set, and Jesus is asking this all-important question to them. Basically, Caesarea Philippi is the farthest north you could be away from the city of Jerusalem and still be considered in the land of Israel. The city itself and its surrounding region lay at the foot of Mount Hermon. This area is rich in religious history. If you go into the Old Testament and read in Joshua and Judges, the, the towns of Baal Gad and Baal Hermon are located in this region. And you can guess by the name of those towns which God they worshipped. It's known that there were at least 14 temples dedicated to the worship of Baal in this area at the foot of Mount Hermon. As the Greek Empire was rising to power and Alexander the Great conquered this region in the 4th century B.C., the city was eventually renamed after the Greek god Pan, the half-man, half-goat god of shepherds and flocks. And so the, the city was renamed Panion or Panium, depending on whose history or side of history you're reading from. There was a cave at the foot of Mount Hermon in the cleft of the rock where the source of the Jordan flows out of, where a shrine was dedicated to this Greek god Pan, for the citizens of the area to co go to and to, to worship him and offer homage. By the year 20 BC, the Roman Empire has controlled this region now, and Caesar Augustus has gifted the area to Herod the Great, the Herod who was ruling at the time of Jesus' birth. As a thank you note to Caesar Augustus, Herod then built and dedicated a beautiful white marble temple in his honor and name. When Herod the Great passes away, his son, Herod Philip, came into possession of the area, and he renamed, he renamed the area to Caesarea in honor of the emperor then, Tiberius, but so as not to confuse the city with the other Caesarea on the port, the Mediterranean port, Philip, being the humble guy that he was, renamed it after himself, Caesarea Philippi. Philip's city became a central hub and capital for pagan worship. You could worship basically any god of your choosing, but especially the worship of Caesar was prominent at this time. Because Caesar was considered to be a god, Herod's temple was used for the worship of Caesar. 
at least once per year, the citizens in that region were mandated to go to this temple, burn incense on the altar, and proclaim their allegiance and worship, saying, Caesar is Lord. And by that, they don't just mean he is our king, he is our God, is what that phrase meant. So, of course, not only is there the worship of Caesar, but there's the worship of this panoply of other false gods in the area. So against that backdrop, you can imagine why Jesus is taking his disciples to this region. You can even appreciate why he's posing this all-important fundamental life question before his disciples on the way. There's a stark contrast from this location and its false gods to that of the identity of Jesus. It's almost as if Jesus is leading his disciples on to draw the only veritable conclusion to the question he's about to ask them. So, we have a symbolic location, that's marker number one. Marker number two comes in the following part of the verse. After the symbolic location, Caesarea Philippi, Jesus now is asking the disciples a significant question. A significant question. Really, there's two questions that Jesus asks, but really it's just one. I think the first question he poses to his disciples is just a general question to get their minds racing and thinking for themselves. How would they answer this question? So first, Jesus asked his disciples a general question. And on the way, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. Mark records the disciples giving three different opinions from the general populace, probably referring to the Jews. Overall, the people agreed that Jesus was some kind of prophet. Some said that Jesus was John the Baptist. Now, to Mark's original audience, that might have come as a shock. After all, Jesus and John the Baptist were only separated by just a few months in age, and and even their ministries, as we've already seen at the very beginning of Mark, have started to overlap. So how could it be that Jesus is John the Baptist. However, recall what happened after Herod had John the Baptist beheaded in Mark chapter 6. As Jesus' name and fame were increasing in the region, people came and, and said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. The superstitious belief at the time was that if someone was resurrected from the dead... He was given supernatural powers to perform great miracles, such as the kind that Jesus was doing. Jesus' ministry, it's drawn so much attention. It's been accompanied with such great works of power, supernatural power, the people admit, that they wondered if God had raised John the Baptist from the dead to continue his prophetic ministry of introducing the Messianic kingdom. Herod himself, we know, probably burdened with the guilt for having executed John in the first place, also believed that Jesus was John reincarnate. But when Herod heard of the news, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. Speculated by commentators that Herod was fearing that John was going to come back from the dead and deliver God's vengeance upon him for his many sins that John had called out while he was alive. So, to Herod and to these others... Jesus was John the Baptist, or at least he was indwelt with John's spirit to perform these mighty works that he'd been doing. Others weren't so sure. They said, I don't think he's John the Baptist. I think Jesus is Elijah. The people knew well those prophecies in the book of Malachi that predicted Elijah, who if you read in, uh, further back in the Old Testament, he's taken up bodily into heaven, not having tasted death himself, They believed that he was going to come again from heaven to prepare the way for the day of the Lord, the visible manifestation of God's kingdom on earth where Messiah would reign. Those prophecies come to us in Malachi 3 and 4. The Lord prophesies through Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And again in chapter 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. The Jew takes these prophecies in Malachi literally, whether that was back in Jesus' day or even today. 
the common Jewish belief is that Elijah is going to literally return in the flesh and he is going to usher in God's kingdom and Messiah will come and reign on David's throne in Jerusalem. However, as we're going to see just one chapter later in Mark chapter 9, as well as other places in the other four Gospels, Jesus took these prophecies in Malachi to be figurative, not literal. Jesus would teach his own disciples that Elijah has already come, referencing John the Baptist. And that's why Mark, at the very beginning of his gospel in chapter 1, introduces John's ministry by quoting that passage in Malachi 3 to illustrate that John is the forerunner to the Messiah, to the coming of the day of the Lord and the kingdom of the Lord is manifested in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Then there were still others who were divided on this issue, and they said, he's one of the prophets, the prophets. If you go to Matthew's account, Matthew includes the name Jeremiah specifically. Others, perhaps a general view at that time, was that Jesus was the prophet that Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy 18. There, the Lord promises to raise up a prophet like Moses, who would have God's word in his mouth, and he would turn the people of Israel to himself. They would listen to him, and they would obey what he had to say. Again, the expectation here is that this prophet, like unto Moses, was going to be the final prophet before the Messianic kingdom. Some even took that to be Elijah, who was going to precede and prepare the way for the Messianic kingdom, for Messiah to come into the world. And so the general overall opinion of Jesus, according to these responses, was that Jesus was to be held in high regard. He was to be respected as a prophet. But these responses show that he was not to be received as the Messiah, nor was he to be revered as the divine Son of God. The general opinion at the time from the Jews was that Jesus was a very great man, maybe a prophet to be respected, but definitely not a God to be be reverenced and worshipped. Put Jesus' general question into the context of modern-day America. America prides itself in being a giant melting pot of different cultures, ethnicities, values, and religions. Our country, it's become, as it were, like a modern-day Caesarea Philippi, filled with a panoply of different religions, gods, and we're flush with idolatry, not just figurines on a shelf, But think of the American dream or success or whatever else. Fill in the blank. We're flush with idols. Imagine Jesus asking his church in America, who do Americans say that I am? We just looked at the popular religions in our nation. I think we could come up with responses on their behalf. The Muslim says that Jesus was a great prophet, but he was not the Christ and he's definitely not God. The Hindus, on the other hand, might say that Jesus is a god, small g, but one of millions. The Mormons believe that Jesus is God's created son, along with Lucifer, who is Jesus' brother. While they claim Jesus is a god, small g, a created god, they don't believe him to be the unique son of God. They don't believe him to be co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. They deny the Trinity. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they claim to believe that Jesus is Jehovah's first created being as well. They believe that he was the Christ when he came and was born of a virgin, but they reject his divinity, they reject his substitutionary atonement on the cross, and they reject his bodily resurrection from the dead. They don't worship him as Lord and God. They, like the Mormons, deny the Trinity. Ask the New Age spiritualist, And they'll say that Jesus certainly was not God. He was not a savior. Man doesn't need a savior from sin. Jesus was merely a spiritual guru and moral teacher for mankind to learn how to be better and learn how to transcend, whatever that means. Overall, ask a person on the street, and society believes that Jesus existed, that he was a great teacher. He had some good ideas about loving others and doing good to others but they don't believe that he is the savior for sinners or that he is God incarnate, God in the flesh. Most people will acknowledge 
He existed according to history. But they'll refuse to bow the knee to his authority or give him the worship he deserves. At most, they'll respect him as a prophet, as some of these religions that we've just talked about do. But certainly, they won't receive him as Messiah and revere him as God. So that's the general question. Who do people say that I am, Jesus asked. Next, Jesus makes the question infinitely more personal for his disciples. He turns to them and he asks them, but who do you say that I am? The you in the Greek is emphatic. It's placed at the beginning of Jesus' question. But you, who do you say that I am? It's a soul-piercing question to his disciples. This question, it's weighty and it's worthy of hard, deep reflection and consideration on behalf of each of the twelve The Greek grammar of verse 29 here suggests that Jesus kept on asking this question to each of his disciples. The verse could read, and he kept on asking them, but who do you say that I am? It's as if Jesus turned to look each disciple in the face and individually, personally ask them, James, who do you say that I am? John, who do you say that I am? Andrew, who do you say that I am? And then on down the list, even to Judas Iscariot. They've been with him long enough, over a year now, to have come up with their own educated idea. Jesus is asking each of his followers, whom he's chosen personally, called into ministry, and is now training for ministry, what they believed about his identity. You've seen my works, you've heard my words, who do you say that I am? Again, picture Jesus asking this same question to those in America who claim to be followers of Jesus today, to those who profess themselves to be Christian. What would the general response be to such a fundamental question to the church? Who do you say Jesus is? Actually, we really don't have to wonder. There have been enough surveys released and research garnered over the last few years One such survey is developed by Ligonier Ministries. Every two years, on the even years, Ligonier Ministries commissions a survey of thousands of Americans who profess themselves to be Christians, and they call the survey the State of Theology. The survey, it's comprised of different statements that a recipient is responsible to answer, strongly agree, somewhat agree, not sure, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree. Ligonier then uses the research they gather to help Christians in America understand what the church in America believes about hot topics like Jesus, the Bible, the gospel, and the Trinity. And really, it's uh, to better equip the church for stronger disciple-making is what their goal is. Let me just share one statement from the most recent survey in 2020. You probably can't see that very well. I'll read it for you. This is posed to professing Christians, remember. People had to respond with whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement. Here's the statement. Statement 7 reads, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. This is how professing Christians around America responded. 28% strongly agree that Jesus was not God. Another 23% somewhat agree that Jesus was not God. There are 12% caught in the middle who were unsure of what to think about whether Jesus was God or not. There were 10% who somewhat disagreed with the statement, believing that Jesus is God. And only 27% strongly disagreed with the statement, claiming that Jesus was God. That's a combined 51% of professing Christians who do not believe that Jesus is God. That's five out of every ten Christians in America. Less than four out of ten Christians in America profess that Jesus is God. And then there are one out of every ten Christians proclaiming to be Christians who don't know what to believe about Jesus at all. I won't depress you any further by showing you the other findings of this survey. It's very disheartening. The state of theology in America is in rapid decline. Needless to say, there's a deep need to correct unorthodox theology in the church, 
as well as for us Christians here in this very church to grow deeper in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who do you say that he is? That is the fundamental question you personally need to answer, whether you're a Christian or not. So we've just seen from the survey results, it's important what Christians have to say about Jesus. Who do you say Jesus is? So that's marker number two. We come now to the third marker in the text that helps us arrive at the correct answer to Jesus' question. Who do you say Jesus is? And here we have a supernatural confession made by the apostle Peter. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Christ, you probably know this by now, but it's the Greek word for anointed. Your Bible might even have that in a footnote. The name or the title is based on the Hebrew word for to anoint or anointed one. In the Old Testament, the word doesn't always refer to one person, the Messiah, as we commonly view it. It was used to various groups of God's people throughout Israel's history. As we go throughout the Bible, we see that there are three different classes of people in Israel who were viewed as God's anointed ones. There were the prophets, the priests, and the kings. Interestingly, the very first appearance of this Hebrew word for anointed is in Leviticus chapter 4, which deals with the laws for sin offerings. There we're told that the anointed priest would sacrifice a bull on the altar and then sprinkle its blood as a sin offering for the congregation of Israel. Only the anointed priest was authorized to intercede on behalf of the sins of the congregation of the people. Prophets, too, were also viewed as anointed ones. They were anointed by the Lord to speak as his mouthpiece to the people. For example, we see in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah going before the the thrice holy God, and his lips are touched with that burning coal, purifying his, his speech, but also atoning for his sins. He's now commissioned, he's now anointed to be the bearer of God's message to the people. So the priests, they were anointed to represent sinful man to God. The prophets were anointed to represent God's word to God's people. But the kings of Israel, they were effectively anointed to represent God's rule over God's people and God's authority over his people, enforcing God's laws to be obeyed. Eventually, the most common conception of Messiah was that he was going to be an anointed eschatological king from the line of David who would establish and then protect this everlasting kingdom of righteousness and peace over all the earth, and Israel was going to be the centerpiece of all the kingdoms on the earth. According to the New Testament, Jesus as Messiah, God's anointed one, fulfills each of these three offices, anointed prophet, priest, and king. As God's anointed prophet, Jesus is God the Word made flesh, revealing the glory and the gospel message of the Father to sinful man. As God's anointed priest, Jesus is the only mediator between God and men who represents sinners before God, reconciles them to God, and redeems them through his blood sacrifice. And as God's anointed king, we read in Revelation that Jesus is king of kings, lord of lords, ruling over the universe and especially over his people, the church. Right now, in our hearts, we we know that to be true, but one day we're going to physically and visibly see that in our presence. He is king. But for the Messiah, for Jesus to be the Messiah specifically, it means much more than him being an anointed prophet, priest, and king. If we go to Matthew's account, Peter's confession in Matthew 16, we get a better understanding of this fact. The same question is posed to Peter there. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. We see here that Peter's confession truly is supernatural in two respects. Firstly, according to Peter, for Jesus to be Messiah means that Jesus is also the divine Son of the Father. He said, you are the Christ. And then he expounds what that meant. 
what this means for Jesus to be Messiah is that he is the son of the living God. Jesus is not merely a human Messiah, as the Jews expected in that day, but as the author of Hebrews will state, he is the exact imprint of God's nature. As the Nicene Creed puts it, Jesus is very God of very God. God incarnate, God in the flesh. Jesus is divine Messiah. Secondly, Peter's confession is supernatural according to Jesus in verse 17. Jesus told Peter that he had not come to this conclusion about Jesus' divinity and messiahship all on his own. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, Peter. It was my heavenly Father who told you this. As we learned last week, Peter needed the eyes of his heart enlightened by God and opened in order to see Jesus. According to Jesus, Peter's confession is evidence that God has already begun to touch the eyes of Peter's heart and he can partially see Jesus for who he is in the moment. Although at this very moment, I think Peter's vision isn't perfectly clear. He has the right confession, but as we're going to learn next week, he had the wrong content behind that confession. Peter sees Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, but in a few short verses, he's going to reprimand Jesus' teaching about the Messiah having to suffer and die and rise again. Like the blind man after receiving the first touch from the Lord, Peter's eyes have been opened here to make a right confession about Jesus. But Jesus is merely but a tree walking before him. His theological vision is still a little bit fuzzy. Peter's confession is correct. Jesus is Christ. He is the Son of the living God. But the content behind his confession has been misguided or misinformed. His theology about the Christ is off. The fact that the Messiah had to suffer and die did not fit yet into his box of stale doctrine he had been taught by his spiritual leaders. Peter needed the eyes of his heart touched once again to see who Jesus really is more clearly. In light of this, we read in verse 30 in our text, Jesus strictly charged his disciples to tell no one about him. The same verb that Mark used when demons were being Um, identifying Jesus as the Son of God, the Holy One of Israel, Jesus would silence them. He would reprimand them. That's the same verb that Mark uses when Jesus literally admonishes his disciples to tell no one that he is Messiah. We might be a little bit puzzled about that. Isn't it our job to evangelize, to tell others that Jesus is Christ? Well, if the disciples are misinformed and they have misconceptions about what that truly meant, The message that they were going to proclaim would only foster further false views about and misplaced faith in Jesus as Messiah. It would not be until after Jesus would suffer, die, and rise again that he would finally commission his disciples to go out and tell the world that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Only then would they have the full picture, the right confession mixed with right content behind it. So we look at this passage as a whole. There's a couple of applications for us to take away with this morning. Number one, you need to answer Jesus' question for yourself personally if you have not yet. Who do you say Jesus is? He is the divine Messiah, is what Peter said. The gospel writer Mark has been quite obvious on that fact. Mark 1.1, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Peter's confession, he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. As Peter did, confess Jesus as Christ, the Son of the living God. He is divine Messiah, fully God yet fully man. How that works, I don't know. It does. To confess anything less is heresy. Puts you in with the camp of the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. A wrong confession to this question will not make you right with God. Jesus' question demands a response. It demands an answer. What's your verdict? Based on the evidence you have in your lap right now, you must answer this question. It's literally the difference between heaven and hell. This morning, if you're on the fence about who Jesus is, today is the day to make a decision. You might not have tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, that is, made right with God, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Your answer to Jesus' personal question, it's going to chart the course for the rest of your life. By faith, confess Jesus to be your Messiah and Savior, your Lord and your God. If that's your confession, then you're blessed. You have the favor and grace of God, just as Peter did, according to Jesus. Application number two, this is for the church. This is for my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This is for us who are Christians. Having seen those survey results pulled from those who profess to be Christians about the identity of Jesus, we must grow deeper in our theology and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our theme for this year. Grow deeper. Your confession may be right, but what about the content? Continue to go to Jesus so that He can correct your spiritual vision and deepen your understanding about who He is, His nature, His person, and His mission. Church, Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, This is a confession upon which Jesus is building His church around the world right now. How important is it then that we have the right content underneath a right confession? This confession gives to us the keys of the kingdom of heaven, as it were, empowering us to prevail against hell, to go out and rescue the perishing, and to exalt Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to His deserved place in the world and in His church. May the Lord bless us as we hold fast to our good confession without wavering. For Jesus has promised to build His church, and He is faithful to do it. Let us therefore strive for greater unity in this good confession that He is the Christ. And let us grow deeper in the knowledge of the Son of God, Jesus, Messiah. Let's pray. O oh Lord, how good it is to have Jesus as our Savior, as our Messiah. Merely a human Savior could not rescue us. For you in Isaiah proclaim that besides you there is no Savior. And so only God incarnate, only Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, could rescue us, reconcile us, and redeem us from sin. Lord Jesus, we honor You today. We worship You as God, and we follow You as our Messiah, asking You to guide us, to impart Your wisdom upon us so that we can see the things of God clearly and not be distracted by the things of man. O Lord, give us a clear vision of You, we pray. Amen.